is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 3, Episode 8, Lord of the Pies. In this episode, one of the pie sigs is targeted for a prank seems way too light a word. And we find out that that one rape isn't the only fake rape that has happened. And I'm unimpressed. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank Rachel for commissioning this episode. Um, oh, Rachel just popped up in the chat just as I was saying thank you. Well, hi, Rachel, and thank you. So, Rachel, now that I've thanked you, I have to tell you I hate you and I'm mad at you and never speak to me or my son again. <laughs> <laughs> What are they doing, you guys? Why are they doing this to me? <sighs> Why are they doing this to me? We find out that yet another rape was faked. And that potentially many of them were. I don't know what's happening here. I can't tell. If everybody whose head was shaved was part of the conspiracy, I don't think so. I think what's happening is that there are two things ha like there's there's an actual rapist who's doing head shaving for reals. And then there's the copycats that are using these actual rapes as a means of, of publicizing their agenda if I'm not mistaken, because I don't get the feeling, and I could be wrong about this, that Max's roommate was like particularly interested in getting rid of the frats. I feel like she sounded the most, she seemed genuinely flipped out and you know we haven't actually the only other victim that we've really met is from the previous season for with uh the chick who was in arrested development weirdly and i don't think she seemed like she was part of an agenda like she had seemed to have gotten on board with getting rid of the frats because of what happened to her but I didn't seem to like sense that she had been involved before that. Like, I don't know if she was the first one that this had happened to, or if it was the, she was the first person that like was very public about what had happened. But so I think that we've got at least two that are genuine. And then we have the two with these girls that Veronica knows who have faked it. Why, why, why would you do this? Look, honestly, in terms of story, I get it. Okay. Just having there be a serial rapist isn't super interesting. Kind of played out. So I can understand from a storytelling perspective you feel like you want to make things more interesting, add some twists and turns, some surprises, some red herrings. But this is why you don't choose to tell a story centering rape. Because I don't give a fuck about making the story interesting. I don't give a fuck about twists and turns and red herrings when you're dealing with subject matter that is this serious and this poorly handled in real life already. 
don't do it. If you feel the need to be this creative about it, stay the fuck away from it because you're too immature to handle this subject matter. So I understand in a a hypothetical sense why telling the story, they thought this was going to be more interesting. However, as a woman, it's offensive. And I can't imagine the kind of damage this did because I don't think that people really understand how much we internalize what we see in fiction. And I know I've talked about this already, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse about it. But I can only imagine the number of kids who saw this show, and by kids I mean kids, like high schoolers, who saw this show and saw all of these like really militant angry women who were protesting and being very extreme. How many people really internalized that and grew to mistrust women in general who seemed to have an agenda? And when I say have an agenda in quotes, it's so disgusting because the agenda is for this shit to be taken fucking seriously. So there's this whole thing about how like, We're supposed to – this show just wants to have its cake and eat it too. They want there to be genuine victims that we feel sorry for. But they also want to paint the women who have a very real grievance as being underhanded, untrustworthy, willing to exploit victims and generally incredibly like tone deaf and insensitive. And – This is not to say that that can't be true of people. People are human beings. There are certainly, I'm positive, activists out there who fuck up and don't do the best for the cause that they're trying to fight for. But the idea that this cause went from we have a problem with misogyny and rape culture on campus and has now been reduced to This frat targeted our one friend in this very specific way, and we have decided to get back at them by trying to eliminate them from campus completely. That hits totally different, and that is not great. It's not to say that their story about what happened to their friend isn't nauseating, because it is. What they wind up telling Veronica later on is that – because – she finds out that there is a date that is significant and that something happened on that date. Eventually what we discover is a girl fell from a roof and there has been some stories that maybe she didn't fall, that something happened to her. Of course, when you hear that you assume it means somebody pushed her off, but it isn't even that simple. What it was, was this girl was subjected to a horrific hazing ritual And had herself stripped either naked or almost naked and all of the parts of her body that were unacceptable circled in permanent marker so that they would last for weeks. And she was told exactly what was wrong with everything about how she looked and the lights were flipped on and there were a bunch of frat boys cracking up behind this two way mirror and They started calling her Marshmallow from then on, and she eventually jumped off the roof in an attempted suicide, which she survived, but then wound up in mental care. And again, it's not like that isn't horrifying. That kind of thing. I think about some of the milder things that have been said to me about my body and how hard they hit me. And it was often people who weren't even being outright cruel. It was people who thought they were being complimentary or thought they were being helpful, which is the worst part. And that stayed with me literally forever 
It will never be gone out of my brain. As long as I live, that shit that was said to me is lodged into my brain. So, yeah, I understand her deciding that what the fuck is the point because nobody gives a shit. Like, I get it. But having it be such a personal thing that these girls are then targeting this frat and in a way that it's so easy for the writers then to be hashtag not all frat boys about it. It's just so frustrating. They are so missing the point. You know, it just feels like such a complete misstep. And I'm really like, I, I, I keep looking at how much we have left of the season and I just can't imagine where we go from here now that this has been revealed. Like, I don't know what Veronica does with this information now because she's aware. They don't straight up admit that they faked a rape. They like, she says it a couple times. Like, that's what she's surmising from their reaction. And they do not correct her and get a guilty look on their face. So... There's nothing that she could have, like, caught on recording or nothing that she could quote. As a, you know, photography, as a photographer for the school newspaper, there's nothing from this that I think she could supply. And I don't think she would necessarily want to. Because she realizes the damage this could do to the real cases. The thing is, though, I hate that Veronica's now being put in the position of either supporting the cause or com being complicit in this lie. Because reminder, Veronica is a rape victim herself. So she has to, she has to, like, watch these girls pretend to have endured the kind of trauma she has and know that they are full of shit and maybe not call them on it. And I don't know if she can do that. Veronica isn't great with, with like the kinds of lies, this, this level of lie. She'll tell little white lies. She'll fib all over the place in order to get information she needs. But that's all in the spirit of getting to an ultimate truth to hold somebody accountable. And I'm not sure this sounds like it, like when you look at it really big picture, that is what she'd still be doing. She's still trying to figure out who the actual rapist is. So keeping quiet about that might be in the best interest of that case. But I don't know. I am not entirely sure about that. Maybe it would cause them to be more sloppy and she could have an easier time catching them at the same time though. She says to them at one point, and I'm going to jump over to that spot because she tells them, um, there was no like physical evidence, right? Oh, yeah, this is when she looks up and she says, possibly a series of rapes. How many of them were real? I mean, other than Chip Dillers, which we will talk about. There hasn't been any forensic evidence, no semen, no hair found on any of the victims. I. So that sounds like any, any. Which makes it sound like all of them were fake. Have they just been drugging girls and shaving their heads and then letting the girls think that they've been raped? Is that what did they start this like narrative of what happened and then they've just been doing that to make girls think that this because I feel like the fact that there hasn't been any forensic evidence on any of them that feels really surprising. It would be one thing if these two who we know faked it didn't but other people did and oh that's really weird 
But if nobody did, I find that particularly surprising. I mean, I don't know. And we have this whole thing about Veronica herself getting drugged and somebody beginning to shave her head. So that's part of what I mean when I say, were they like just letting girls think that they had been raped? Like, is this, were they going to let Veronica think that she had been victimized in order to get her more on their side because they feel that she's somehow against them? And that maybe she would, if she were personally victimized, have like be singing a different tune? Which is just so ironic because I guess they don't know that she actually already is a rape victim and that's part of why she's actually taking this seriously. I just... I don't like it. I don't get it. I don't like it. We're going to back up, though. Because I, I started talking about all of this out of the gate because I'm just... I'm so frustrated by the direction that that is all going. And I keep every week, every time that I cover one of these episodes, I've been hoping that they manage to sort of pull it out and turn things around a little bit. And it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. But we have so much left of the season that I am also holding out hope that it's just going to be darkest before the dawn. And that we'll get to the middle of the season and I'm going to be so angry. Like I'll just really have plumbed the depths of rage. And then all of a sudden the show is going to begin to turn it around. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I want to believe it. But if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be pretty mad about it. I'm going to take it personally a little bit, you know? Um, so... What what begins here is Veronica gets sent to cover this reception for a woman named Selma Hurst Rose. Um, she is a swing vote, uh, apparently, with like getting the the frat houses disbanded, if I understand correctly, and she's a huge philanthropist and activist and humanitarian and whatnot. And they have a, this reception for her that is meant to honor her. And she had been there, but fails to appear when the Dean calls her to the front to give her speech. And the Dean is just immediately like something bad has happened. And of course, when he talks to Sheriff Lamb, Lamb could not give fewer fucks about this rich woman. It's super funny, too, because the dean is so certain that something terrible has happened to her and is so mad that Lamb doesn't take it seriously. But then Lamb is kind of proven right because she is nothing has happened to her. We wind up finding out that she is uh, keeping herself secluded and away and there's this whole blackmail thing going on, which we will get to. So this, this whole, whole subplot is happening in conjunction with this other one. Because when Veronica is given this assignment to cover this like reception... She's talking to the new editor of the paper, who is this dude who ha there's a really funny moment where he asks her what she's doing Saturday night. And she thinks that he might be asking her out. And it turns out that it's only because of this reception and he's making sure that she'll be free. And I just could not help but laugh because <laughs> it is such an awkward moment. It's like you don't want to sound like you're really full of yourself by assuming somebody's asking you out. But when you're a woman... Men ask you out in the most unbelievable circumstances sometimes. You are just like, are you really doing this right now? And they still will, you know. So I don't blame her for, like, maybe thinking that. Oh, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. So Rachel in the comments says the actress who played her was the real Patty Hearst. 
That explains it. Because the next thing I was going to say is that the woman who plays this character is one of the worst actresses that has ever been on this show. She is really rough. It took me completely out of every scene she was in. Her line delivery is so stilted and awkward and the inflections on certain words are really weird. She is just a mess. And I I kept being like, who is she? Like at first I thought, it's funny that she winds up being like somebody that's actually famous because I was like, is she related to somebody who was doing the directing like, and, and somebody did a favor? Why did they cast her? And now it makes sense. Um, she asks worse than Paris Hilton in season one. Yes. Paris Hilton wasn't even that bad. Like she's pretty bad, but she's playing pretty much who she is, which is a rich snobby bitch. And that really, she pulled that off because that's who she is. She just barely had to act for that. But this whole thing, you know, she's like trying to be the wronged woman who's being blackmailed and who got seduced and this whole, and you just feel nothing coming off her. There is no emotion coming off her. There is no, there is no bitterness or resentment or anything. It's just a blank fucking vacuum. And I just couldn't understand it. I kept wanting, like, every scene she was in, I was like, oh, my God, what is she doing? And it just, yeah, that makes it all make sense. Thank you, Rachel, because I had no idea. I didn't even know that the real Patty Hearst was still alive. And that's who I thought that they were, like, referencing as well when they were talking about, because this family has Hearst in their name. Um, So I thought that it was sort of an, uh, you know, analog to her family. And that makes sense. Um, but anyway, so Veronica's in the middle of getting given this assignment and these two dudes come in and they have a photo of, uh, Chip Diller, who is the president of the Pi Six, and he is passed out on the quad in his underwear with his head partially shaved. And we find out later that he had an Easter egg shoved up his ass that had a Roman numeral in it. That is what leads Veronica to figuring out what this is all related to, because it's a date and it's again, it's so deeply fucked up that this show thought it would be cool. If we just had the big bad dude get raped as though these women are making a point doing that to somebody else instead. I just, I just hate it so much. You guys, I hate so much. Everything about the way this is going is so frustrating. And I appreciate at least that Veronica says, were any of the rapes real other than chip dealers? Because it is, you know, they, they, shoved something inside of his body against his will while he was drugged. That is rape. And I'm glad they at least acknowledge that in the show. But I also hate that we like, I am, I am supposed to, as a viewer, believe that these girls would do something like this after protesting how the campus doesn't take rape seriously that they that this is how their minds would work i just don't buy it that's not to say it's absolutely not the same like it's not it's unthinkable um i can understand wanting if you had been victimized by a person wanting to subject them to what you had experienced as revenge but that's not what he did. He humiliated a girl until she attempted suicide. But they're not getting back at him with the same thing he did to her. They're getting back at him with a very specific, like, vicious method that is analogous to what they're claiming has happened to them, which hasn't even happened. Oh, it's just such a mess. It's just such a mess. If they had, if they had circled his body with Sharpie 
in all these places and then dumped him on the lawn, that would be one thing, you know, but the, and and written the date in permanent Sharpie across his forehead. That would be one thing. It would feel like it made sense in comparison to what it is these girls are actually supposed to be angry about. But this sort of thing, it just it it just keeps feeling like the show is trying to make a point that activists can be violent and terrible too. That really feels like what their whole fucking message is this season. It's just like, well, you know, people will sometimes get a little bit too passionate about a cause and, and sure, maybe the cause is in general a, a valid issue that we need to take seriously, but you can go too far. That's never been a particular problem of activists regarding rape. I haven't heard of people faking rape to make a point about rape. I've never heard of activists regarding rape issues, raping other people in order to make a point about it either. This isn't a thing that happens. In other words, this feels like a, a whole season of a straw man. Um, so, Veronica, uh, she is heading out and ducks past her dad to go to this reception and she runs into Logan. This is the one thing this episode that I liked, which is the two of them do seem to actually be falling apart. And I am pretty much here for this. I don't. I, I said, you know, last episode, I just, the two of them don't really make sense together anymore. There doesn't seem to be a lot of chemistry. They don't seem to be spending much time together. When they do spend time together, they're always fighting and arguing. I am just not super interested anymore. And he comes at her, understandably, like, upset and worried because he found her drugged on the floor of a parking garage and with her head all, like, begun to be shaved He's very worried about her and he tells her that he wants her to stay away from this rape case and to stop sticking her nose into things. And she's rightfully like, this isn't anything that you can seriously be asking me to do. You know who I am. Why would you expect me to pull back from this? You have been aware of who I am when we since we started dating. This is my personality and what I believe in and, and what I do. And if you're not cool with that, I just don't know what to tell you. And look, I totally get him being worried about her. I really do. But she has a complete point. However, then he comes back at her with, uh, you tell me I can't try to change you because you are who you are, but you try to change me all the time. And I can tell that you know I have a point and you're still sure you're right. Look, he, he, he's not wrong. That's a very valid point. The thing is, though, that Logan is self-destructive in a way that Veronica isn't. Because he has so many more traumas than she does. And so much more baggage. So he does require more changes than she does, I think, to become a balanced adult. Some of us need more work than others. That's just an unfortunate factor of, of nature versus nurture, whatever you want to call it, the, the circumstances of our lives, some people go through more and need a lot more help and have much few, many fewer examples of healthy adults to emulate and, and to, you know, like she has her father and he is a genuinely good person who tries his best who was in Logan's life? Like, show me anyone in Logan's life that he could look up to in any genuine way to 
show him how to be, how to be, period. So the thing about Logan is that he needs therapy and she's right about the things that need work with him. But she also needs to acknowledge that she doesn't feel about him the way that she either used to feel or should feel. And so I really liked this this first fight. He really starts to yell at her and her father finally comes out and is like, hey, dude, because he says you're not invincible and you're not always right. And her dad comes out and says, you might want to stop yelling at my daughter. And he says, yeah, you might want to start and stalks out. And when they get together a little bit later and they have this conversation and he's throwing it in her face that she's always trying to change him, the catalyst for her getting up in his face at all is that there is a fight that breaks out in the cafeteria and this dude scoops her up and carries her off. And it turns out that this is basically a bodyguard that has been hired by Logan to follow her around in case anybody should try to attack her again. And she's really, really angry about it because he didn't tell her. So she kept hearing sounds of somebody following her, assuming that here comes the rapist to try again. And then realizes that probably it was this fucking guy the whole time. Now, on the one hand, I understand him not telling her, especially being super annoying. On the other hand, wanting to hire protection for her makes a ton of sense. And while I, I know what she means about him not having the right, I'm not super mad at Logan for that. I figure that's a good compromise, to be honest. If he had only been honest with her about it. She gets to continue her investigations, gets to keep being who she is, but there is somebody constantly at her back to make sure the whole time that everything is okay. You know what? That seems to me to be a pretty good solution. The thing is that, again, he wasn't honest with her about it. He didn't tell her what he was doing. And I don't know how she would have reacted if he had come to her with a suggestion. If he had said, hey, look, I have the money. I'm thinking of hiring somebody to just shadow you and make sure that you're okay. You keep doing what you're doing. I don't want to change that. But you have wandered into some really bad situations more than once. And that was when somebody wasn't really specifically after you. Please let me do this and it will be peace of mind for me and you get to continue to do what you do. And I like to think, even though she'd have probably put up a fight about it, that she would understand ultimately that his heart was in the right place. But because of how he decides to do this, it's just, it, it just brings out this whole other side. And he says, I don't care if you're angry. I care if you're safe. And she says, this is not some new facet of my personality. You know who I am. You know what I do. Um, and it isn't going to change. And if you can't accept that, then this isn't going to work. You know who I am. And you're constantly expecting me to change. And then he says, I love you, Veronica. I love you. Do you love me? And she says, yeah. She looks at him with tears in her eyes and says, yeah. I don't think she do, though. Right? Later on, at the very end of the episode, she's in the cafeteria. He calls her up. She does not take his call. And it turns out he's standing right there and he watches her decline his call and sit down at a table alone. So it's not even like, oh, Wallace is here. I can't talk right now. I'm hanging out with Wallace. There's literally nobody else there and no reason that she couldn't take that call except for, and I know this is not the point in the episode, but 
I'm just saying, personally, I never take phone calls in public places. It's just, in my opinion, deeply rude. You're, you have to raise your voice in order for the other person to hear you over the din in the background. And thus, you are disturbing everyone who is actually around you. And usually the person on the other end of the line doesn't hear you adequately anyway. And you just have to get up and go somewhere quiet, go into the hall, go outside. If you have to do that, just don't take the call. And then go outside and call them back or text back and let them know. So in that respect, her not taking the call from me is meaningless because I probably wouldn't have taken the call either were I her. But she also doesn't attempt to contact him in any other way. I do want to keep in mind that she just found out that these girls have organized more than one false rape. And maybe she's not prepared to have a conversation right now because her brain is a little bit preoccupied. And I am completely willing to go with that also. But I don't, I want to believe what I think the episode intends for me to believe, which is simply that this moment when he says, all right, then can we try to go a little easier on each other? And she takes a deep breath and says, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And he hugs her and says, so are we okay? And she says, yeah, we're okay. But she has a look on her face. I believe this is supposed to be, no, they are not okay. They are, she is trying to get past it because she does see that he has a point. But they aren't actually okay. And I think her realization that he he has a point about constantly trying to change him is a factor in want in wondering whether or not she does love him because that's the thing when you really love a person you can't want to change basic things about their personality it's it's just incompatible if you feel yourself wanting to change these kinds of things either your love is not entirely genuine or it's conditional and if it's conditional, it just doesn't count either. So if there are major facets of somebody's personality that you can't deal with now, you can't tell yourself, well, I'm sure eventually he'll grow out of that because that is a classic blunder, especially that women make because women are for some reason seen as rehabilitators. And oftentimes we put ourselves in the position of making a man better than he was in order to earn our place at his side. It's like some function that we think we have to, we have to perform as a partner is to make our men better. Whereas we are expected to be excellent without help. We aren't supposed to need any additional growth or support. We are supposed to provide it. And that is all. And I have just personally made that mistake so many times because it's a combination of meeting a lot of ain't shit men and also personally being a control freak as I am. And I'm only now beginning to like really grasp how many relationships I've had that were kind of dependent on this concept of making somebody change. And wanting them to just make these paradigm shifts in who they were. So I feel for Veronica, you know, this isn't like a completely unrelatable problem that she's facing. It's not like she doesn't care about Logan at all. I don't believe that. But I think that she's realizing she wants to be with somebody who accepts her completely as she is. And she wants somebody who's going to be much more honest with her and not like test, put her to the test, um, which it feels like he kind of enjoys doing a little bit. It seems like he wants to get her suspicions up in order to see how she'll react so that he can sort of point at it and be like, see, you don't trust me. I wasn't even doing anything. And, there's a reason why she doesn't entirely trust him, man. He's got a very sketchy past and has done some really sh awful shit. And like that running away from that fire, 
I'm still not over that. You know, I can't believe that that hasn't, I have a feeling it's going to come up again eventually, but the fact that it's a, like, it hasn't come up again in conversation. I would love to know if that is anything, if that's a major factor in her feelings changing towards him, because this will happen when you're in a relationship and you're beginning to sense something doesn't feel right between you and the other person anymore. Oftentimes there will come what you don't realize at the time, but you'll look back later and realize is a real definite turning point where you find out something about that person and the way they handled a situation or the way they mentally reacted to something you said or the response they had to something that will suddenly break open this like there was a tiny crack in things and then all of a sudden it just there's a, a huge opening it can be really upsetting when it happens i remember this specifically in my marriage um and brendan having a reaction to something and me it was like a kind of a throwaway line for him and I felt like I had been punched and he had no idea he was talking and he threw this thing out and had no inkling of how it affected me to hear it. But I had to sit down. I was so shook by it. And I kind of like shook it off and continued on and tried to behave as everything had been, but it had wedged itself in my brain and sort of shifted everything for me in one direction and if I were Veronica in the situation with Logan that she is, and I heard about this thing with the fire, that would be it for me. This would be the the nexus point uh, of the two of us diverging. That would just, I don't think I could get past that. That would be it. And I wonder if her realizing it doesn't matter what's at stake. I'm always going to do the thing that is supposed to help people. I'm always going to try and save people. I'm always going to search for truth. And I am with somebody who ran. Those don't go together. Those are two fundamentally different outlooks on life and your responsibility to other human beings. And that is a kind of a basic moral foundation that you have to share with your partner or else shit is not going to go well, you know? Um, and look, I, I said, even during the episode when he, he defends himself by being like, I did what 90% of people would do. I'm not even disagreeing with him. I think he's right about that. But the thing is that Veronica isn't 90% of girls. She is a very particular type. And for her to want to have a partner that isn't 90% of people, I don't think is unreasonable. He is much more ordinary than she is. And maybe she doesn't want ordinary. And she gets to demand that. You know, we all get to draw our lines where we want to draw them. Whether or not we're actually going to find somebody that meets our standards, that's not even really relevant. You get to have your standards wherever you feel like putting them. And... The moment when she doesn't pick up his phone call at the end of the episode, he gets a look on his face like he really feels like that's it. It seems like he thinks that's the end of their relationship. It's the proof he needs because he asks, but do you love me? Because he seems to really sense maybe she doesn't. And so this, I think, is his answer. He doesn't think she does. And this proves it to him. I tend to think he's right. I know I said a lot about not answering the phone and everything. But even considering that she just found out about these false rapes, when you go through some shit like that, that's so upsetting. The first thing you want to do if you have a healthy relationship is talk about it with your partner because they are supposed to be your support. And if you can't do that or if you don't feel the urge to do that. I feel like that's kind of a bad sign. So him coming to try and like call her 
when she has just found out some disturbing shit and her instinct is not to answer and pour out her guts to him. Not great, you know? Um, so anyway, <laughs> I love that Rachel in the chat said, yay, there was one thing. Cause I said that I liked this at least in the episode. Cause yeah, otherwise there's this whole other thing going on. It's really, so we find out that the, um, Pi Sigs are doing this, uh, I can't remember what the name of it is, but I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this. It's a competition to see how many girls you can sleep with and the different girls are worth different amounts of points. So for those who think that this is just a thing that the show is doing that's exaggerated, I would like to inform you that I have personally seen the points cards for this type of game and girls of different races were different numbers of points Asian women rated the highest uh, virgins of course were the very highest getting to have anal sex got you extra points uh, two girls at once super extra points Dick talks about girls with a handicap. That was a thing. Um, brunettes, blondes, redheads were their own categories. And then there's a girl that comes out of a one of the houses that Dick has already slept with. And he tells her that's going to make her points drop. And that's another thing is if you sleep with a girl that one of the other frat brothers has also slept with, she's worth way less points. It's so gross. It makes me so angry to even like talk about it. Cause it's just so gross. And, and the race thing, they were called by like foods. So a, an Asian girl was called lemon meringue pie and a black girl was called chocolate cream pie. Uh, that kind of thing so that they could talk about it amongst themselves in public and people wouldn't know what it was that they were referring to. And so they could just, you know, a girl would walk by and somebody would say something about a type of pie and the girl would have no idea they were referring to her specifically about trying to have sex with her. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's pretty messed up. And I think you also got extra points if you got a girl to cheat on her boyfriend if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was like an extra thing. So Dick is participating in that, which is unsurprising. Um, and he is the one who tells Veronica about what happened with this dude and the egg shoved up his ass. And eventually she finds this guy who, uh, he's homeless and goes through their, their, dumpsters for bottles and cans to collect and she gets him to dumpster dive for her and get that egg and she goes and god bless and uh opens it and gets the numbers out of it and figures out that it's that date so then we have the scene with keith mars as he is trying to talk to the hearsts about what is going on with this disappeared woman who I'm just, I'm just going to call her Patty Hearst. It's fine. that will be easier. First, Keith goes and talks to her brother and the brother is basically in like, my sister is a humanitarian and she wants us to stop doing production out of the country. She wants us to have everything be American made. And because of that, her disappearance has caused all of our stocks to skyrocket because everybody assumes she's been taken out of play. And therefore we're going to continue manufacturing in Asia, which is way cheaper, which will create a much greater profit margin for us. And that makes all of my investors really happy. 
which gives a great motive for him making her disappear. But it turns out it's not, that's not exactly what's going on. So then we go to this scene that's super reminiscent of the big Lebowski, um, where he goes and talks to her husband and there's this assistant who is really unwilling to let him in and talk to her husband, even though that's why he's been called here. He has an appointment. He has been brought here by Mr. Rose. As I mentioned, he's not available at the moment. And all of a sudden he yells, Brant, will you stop harassing our guest? Bring him in here. We find out later that Brant is low-key obsessed with Mr. Rose and Veronica makes a comparison to him being the Smithers to Mr. Rose's uh, Mr. Burns. This is just so, so very, it just, I could not stop thinking about the dude abides this whole thing. It's just the, the supercilious assistant, the, uh, very rich lord and master from a wheelchair at least he's slightly nicer um but yeah it turns out that this dude is having an affair with one of the sorority girls and what they've done is gotten her to seduce his wife in view of a photographer so that they, and seduce, I put in quotes, because she just, there's a photo of them kissing. I don't think that they actually slept together, but I could be wrong about that. And this might just be like, you know, the tame photo out of all of them. But she is keeping her hidden because they're coming up on their 10 year anniversary. And I like that when Veronica says something about the 10 year anniversary to her dad. He's kind of like, babe, what are you talking about? You know how important that is. I can't believe you didn't think of this, but at 10 years, that means that a person is entitled to like half of their, the, their partner's property in a way that I wasn't familiar with. Like I got divorced at seven years. So this wasn't a factor. I didn't get 50% of anything, you know, um, not that I would even have wanted that, but it was, it's something that I'm not super familiar with, but evidently if they keep her out of the way and don't let her sign the divorce papers too soon, he will be able to get much more money out of her. Um, and that's why when she like comes at him a little bit later and she throws the paperwork on the table, she says, you can sign that or you can go to prison basically because he blackmailed and I guess it would count as kidnapped her. I'm not sure if that counts, but I think so. Um, oh, Rachel says the Lebowski references were intentional, by the way. I thought so because they were so, so obvious I was like, there's, this can't be, you know, the whole way that it was set up, but, and, and, and the fact that she isn't dead, even though like, <laughs> I can get you a toe, like <laughs> the whole thing just, it felt really like, I feel like this is on purpose. Okay. That's fun. I, I rather like that the show does this occasionally that they reference other stuff. I can't remember what it was in this other episode that, oh, it was, a uh, excuse me, Oliver Twist. And they had like the Fagin reference. Um, which I, yeah. So I, I like when they do that stuff here and there. Um, so yeah. And, and the conversation that Veronica has with the frat girl is just so like, uh, it's so embarrassing. Cause she says something about like how he's more a man than you'd be able to handle to which Veronica is rightfully like, Oh, Okay, hey, buddy, I don't really need to hear any more about that. Thank you. Um, his wife's theory is that their marriage until his accident was okay. And then suddenly he had something to prove. And having sex with as many women as possible was apparently the way to do it. 
Um, and this is when her dad asks, plenty of couples have split over infidelity. I'm sure you can find a lawyer who would get you out of this less expensively. And she, this is when she says walking punchline, which I honestly, the fact that she actually is Patty Hearst, that feels like a little bit too real of a line. I was, uh, now that I know who she is, I'm kind of like, ooh, ouch, writers. I feel like that was very specific. Um, but yeah, she then shows them the photos. This would put me back at square one. And the sorority girl, I can't get over how much she manages to like make Veronica feels shitty about herself when Veronica's questioning her on the quad because she's like out sunning and Veronica comes up to her and begins to really like press her and she eventually says something like oh and by the way we organized a car wash in order to pay for another round of chemo for our house mother in order to just stick it to Veronica and knowing now that she was up to something this shady and that she is like connected with somebody who has so much money and is still like out here doing, uh, you know, how about you just ask him for some money to help your house mother? But apparently that's not super. She's just using this to make Veronica feel bad. Tells her stay sweet, Veronica. Um, bitch. Talk to the left hand because you ain't right. Um, I really want there to be more retribution for her because she basically walks away from this all. It doesn't seem like there's going to be any sort of consequence long term. And that sucks. I really want so much for her to get slapped upside the head a little bit. Um, and I can't help but think that Bud, who is uh, Patty's husband, was only using her in order to be able to blackmail his wife, right? I am assuming he's not genuinely interested in her. It's just that she was a useful tool. And that maybe is going to be the consequence. But I don't think that we see the fallout this episode, if that's true. Maybe he is interested. Maybe he's just a, a weak old man who uh, winds up falling for a, a college girl. Ugh, so lame. Um, so I feel like that's about it for that plot line. Let's see. Oh yeah. This is when she, the search warrant happens and they wind up finding all of this information about the affair. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. And the end of the episode is the conversation with the girls and Veronica finding out and then uh, Logan calling her. So I guess we're going into the breakup phase. I think that's happening. I think that maybe she's going to face up to the fact that she doesn't love him the way that she was like hoping she did or that he wanted her to. We'll see. I really... I, I can't decide what I want Veronica to do with the knowledge that she has now about the faked rapes. Part of me wants for her to expose these women because I just, it, that's so despicable to me. But on the other hand, I feel like that would do so much damage if there were actual rapes. I just wish that I had a better handle on that because I am assuming that there were, but the fact that there was no forensic evidence for any of them, I find really puzzling. So, and, and the fact that Veronica specifically says, were any of the rapes real except other than Chips, it makes it sound like she's including Parker and she's including direct Arrested Development Girl in that. I'm not positive if that's true or not. Um, mm, yeah, I don't know. Let me do a quick check here and see when the next episode is scheduled for. Um <laughs> We have been having a little bit of trouble with scheduling lately. Forgive me, guys. But I am happy that the one plus side, not the one, there's actually been more than one. But a lot of you know that I have had to postpone my wedding until next year. 
And that has opened up a lot more spaces, um, which means that I will be able to more consistently be covering things through November. So that's good. Uh, for some reason, this like spreadsheet isn't opening. I don't know why. It's just spinning on me. Maybe something's up with Google. But I will let you know. I don't think that there's too long a break, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like there is another one pretty soon. Um, Rachel says, I think we have a voyeur on Friday. Oh, okay, cool. Um, uh, oh, yep, you're right. I see it, Rachel. And you commissioned that one, too. Thank you, lady. Um, season three, episode nine. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, guys, I got banned from Facebook uh, a couple days ago. And... The reason I got banned was for doing a live watch on Facebook Live of Veronica Mars in December of last year. I don't know why it took so long to catch up, but it just they they never penalized me until now. And I'm really glad now that I'm doing my live watches here on Crowdcast. I don't know if that's going to be an issue eventually, but so far I have had no problems. Um, and... I've been doing that thing where I am able to play what's going on in one, uh, what do you call it? One tab on my browser so that you guys can see what I'm watching as well. And that's worked out much better, I think, than the other way. So yeah, guys, um, that will be happening if I'm able to get this up in time, which don't hold your breath, but that'll be 7 p.m. on August 21st. That's 7 p.m. Central Time. Um, but I do have a whole week's worth of episodes to post before this one. So it may be too late by the time this is out. Forgive me guys, but that's what you will look at the calendar for. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I wonder why you want me to voyeur this one, Rachel, what do you, you got up your sleeve? She says, you're welcome. Don't hate me forever. No promises. All right, guys. Thank you again so much. I hope you're enjoying the coverage and I will see you soon very soon with a new episode until then oh my god did you hear my stomach good god until then toodaloo motherfuckers Spoiled Network Podcast.